You're listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks, your source for centered and focused play therapy coaching. Hi, I'm Dr. Brenna Hicks, and this is the Play Therapy Podcast. In today's episode, we are talking through how to explain the child-centered play therapy process. So there are several facets to this, and we've been working up to actually seeing a child in the playroom, right? So all of the previous episodes have been how to prepare and how to understand at a theoretical level what's going on and the principles and the foundational information. And so we're now transitioning into You have your playroom set up, you know the categories of toys, you know what they serve and how to set them up. And so now child is going to be coming to the playroom. So this is going to be really helpful because there's several pieces of this. Because the first is how do you explain the child-centered play therapy process to parents? And then also how do you explain it to children as they're actually entering the playroom? So we'll break down both sides of that because you'll have to be able to do both well in order to thrive in your practice. So first and foremost, you will almost always meet with parents before you meet with the child for the first time. So at our center, we schedule a parent consultation. Child does not attend, and it allows us to hear the whole story, get background information, and then the main goal is to explain the process of the child-centered play therapy model so that parents know what to expect, They understand what's coming. They are prepared for certain things before they take place. And it's just really kind of an informational hour where we really work hard to make sure that we help paint the picture so that they know what to expect. It's really kind of managing expectations. So what we tell parents is that when a child comes in and they're participating in child-centered play therapy, They're given the time, the tools, and the opportunity to make the changes that they need to and that we as the therapists serve as the guide rails so that the work that they need to do can take place. Now, what does that look like practically speaking? That's where the explanation gets a little more specific. And so one of the things that we typically tell parents is what to say to their child before the child comes. And here's your disclaimer. (laughs) Even when you give parents a script and even when you say, here's the way that I encourage you to talk about this to your child. Here's what I would say. Here's how I would frame it. Here's the paragraph that you can read. You can equip them with as much knowledge as humanly possible. And sometimes... Sometimes it's executed flawlessly and it's exactly what you say and everyone celebrates internally. And then sometimes you get the child in the room and they say, yeah, mom told me that I'm going to come and talk to you about all the reasons why I get so mad and that I have anger problems and you're going to help me not be so angry. (laughs) And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's not at all what I said. (laughs) That's not at all what's going to happen either. So... Yes, you know, best best scenario and best laid plans are that you provide your parents with a script of sorts and that they use it with their children. It doesn't always work out that way. But what we typically tell parents to say to their children about what's going to happen when they come is, quote, I went and met with a lady named Miss Brenna. I really like her. I think you will too. She has a huge playroom full of tons of toys, and you're going to get to go and play with her for an hour. And that's the end. So then they usually look at me and say, that's it. I don't say, like, you're a therapist. I don't say you're a counselor. I don't say you're a feelings doctor. That's one of my favorites, but that's sarcastic when I say that. (laughs) A lot of my kids have been like, well, you're like a feelings doctor. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. No, I'm not. So that's that's the, the struggle is parents want to say more than that. So they may actually use the script that you give them, but then they add in all of this other stuff. You can talk to them about anything you want. You can trust them. You can tell them all about what happened with your dad. You can tell them all about your anger problems. You... And so the, the caution and the challenge is to help them understand that the script is enough. 
I met with a lady named Miss Brenna. I really like her. I think you will too. She has a huge playroom full of tons of toys and you're going to get to go and play for her, play with her for an hour. Okay. So what I tell them is there's more to the story. There's more going on, but that will align with your child's experience when they come and they will not feel tricked. They will not feel that they were betrayed. They will not feel that they didn't know the whole story because I am Miss Brenna and I do have a playroom full of toys and they did get to come play with me for an hour. So that is a portion of what's happening, but it is true and it is accurate for their experience and it matches what they were promised. So that is enough. So that is what I typically tell parents to share with their children. Now, sometimes parents will say, what if they don't want to come? What if they refuse to play? What if they ask questions? What am I supposed to say if they say, why are you taking me to play with someone? Parents usually, well, this is true of all of us. It's not just parents. Our what ifs are almost always worse than the actual. And we can what if ourselves to death and they hardly ever come true. So they're usually all in vain and usually none of those things happen, but you will get those questions. And so I just typically reassure them, it is your job just to get them here. I will take it from there. They may say, I don't want to go. Reflect that. Here's what that looks like. You're really nervous about meeting someone new. You're not sure how this is going to go. You're worried you won't like it. You fill in the blank. Okay, so we haven't gotten to skills yet, but if you know even the basics about child-centered play therapy, reflecting feelings, that's going to be where you encourage parents to start. So, and then you just say, we're going to go. If you absolutely hate it and you never want to go back, you can tell me that you never want to go back and we can talk about it. I've never had a child, I'm using an absolute on purpose and I've been doing this for almost 17 years, I've never had a child after the first session refuse to come back, ever, of any age. So as young as two and a half up to 16, the most resistant, angry, I hate you, I hate my parent for bringing me here, I hate this center, I hate my life, I hate, I mean the most angry, resistant, rebellious kids about coming, I've never once had one refuse to come back. Now, how do I, this is a, this is a related bonus. <laughs> how do I handle a child wanting to come back? There is never, absolute on purpose, there is never an assumption made that a child wants to come back after the first session. I always, absolute on purpose, ask. Before the, after the play session is over, we're out in the lobby. I get down on a child's level. We talked about that in an earlier episode, right? Eye level. That means you squat, you kneel, you sit, whatever you have to do. I level, I say, I wonder if you'd like to come back and play with me again. Always the expectation is that they're going to have a say in whether or not they come back again. Why? Because if this feels forced upon them, if this feels like it's an expectation, if this feels like it's me and mom against them and mom and I are in collaboration to make sure that they come back whether they like it or not, then the relationship is fractured and all the rapport that I'm working so hard to build goes out the window. So I always get on their level and say, I wonder if you'd like to come back and play with me again. And I have always gotten a yes. Now, sometimes it's, of course, and they give me a hug and then they leave. And, you know, that's so rewarding and fulfilling. And then sometimes I get the lip curl, one shoulder shrug, half eye shut, I guess, but it is still an agreement that they're willing to come back. They're not being forced. They're not being told. They're not being demanded. They have buy-in. They have power. They have control. So that was a related aside. You got a bonus freebie. But I always tell parents, you get them through the front door, and I will take it from there. Because once you've given them the script— and once you've helped them understand that the child may be a little hesitant and that's normal and it's okay, and they know now the skills of reflecting feeling, then the child comes and you reflect the child's feeling. This is new. You're not really sure what this is going to be like. You've never been here before. I'm a stranger. You don't even know who I am. And you just validate, validate, validate. Because when a child feels heard and understood, 
the relationship is automatically formed. Okay, so that's how we handle telling the parent what child-centered play therapy is going to be like. And in those consultations, I do go through the phases of treatment, which we will cover in a later episode. I do go through the universal outcomes of play therapy, which we will cover. So you'll get more details about what I actually say regarding the process as a whole, but I wanted you to hear what I tell them to tell their child. Okay, so now when the child gets there and you're walking back to the playroom, what does that script look like? So first and foremost, we walk in, we close the door, and the very first phrase that is always said on the first session is, this is our special playroom, and you can play with all the toys in most of the ways that you'd like. This is our special playroom. You can play with all the toys in most of the ways that you'd like. Okay, that communicates a couple of things. This is a special place that's not like any other place. So when parents say, well, if you just let them do whatever they want and be in charge the whole time, like what's to say that they're not going to start throwing things at the house because you let them throw things in the playroom? That's the point of saying this is our special playroom because the connotation and the context is this is a unique environment that doesn't extend to other environments. So what happens here is different than what happens at home, at school, at sports, at church, wherever else the child may go. Okay, so this is our special playtime and you can play with all the toys in most of the ways that you'd like. There's freedom, there's autonomy. You can play with all the toys. So you're in charge, you're the boss. You get to decide what happens in here in most of the ways that you'd like, but there may need to be some limits set, but we don't need to talk about that yet. <clears throat> Excuse me. So you have this concept of there's a unique environment here you get to be in charge, but there may be limits, and we'll get there when we get there. So that's what that initial phrase communicates to the child at a deep level. Okay, so what I typically say once they come in, I give them a choice of where they'd like to sit, because remember, child-centered play therapy is all about the child is in charge, the child gets to make choices, the child gets to make decisions. So I say, okay, I have a few things that I need to tell you, so you can choose to sit on the bobo, you can choose to sit on the chair or you can choose to sit on the floor. Which do you choose? Okay. If you have no idea what I'm doing, that's choice giving. I'll get there in a future episode. So what happens then is I give them a very brief overview of what child-centered play therapy is like. Age appropriate, quick. Remember, rule of thumb, if you can't say it in 10 words or less, don't say it. So it doesn't have to be long and drawn out but you want to give them a very brief overview of what the child-centered play therapy process looks like. So I typically say, okay, we're gonna be in here for 50 minutes, five zero, almost a whole hour. That's the first thing I tell them. Second thing I tell them is, and when you're here, you're in charge. So essentially you're the boss. I say that, then I say, all of these toys are for use. You can choose to play with any of them that you want reinforcing what I already said. And then I say, and every time you come, you'll see me with paper and a pen in my hand. I write down some things so that I don't forget what we do together. So let me pause on that note for a moment. There are some play therapists that do not take notes in session. They wait until after sessions to summarize the session for their file. I have always taken in session notes. That's the way I was trained. That is what is easiest for me. It does not interfere with the session. I never have issues with it. I make notes as we play. My kids are used to it. They know that I take notes. It's, it's not an issue. And for me, it's much more accurate. And I get a lot more out of doing it in the moment rather than trying to think back and remember things and summarize things and make connections. In the moment, it's just much easier for my brain. So I have always chosen to do it while we play. I know there are other play therapists that say, oh, I would never write notes in the middle of a session. That interferes with the connection, whatever. It's a preference issue. See what works best for you. But because I take notes, I share why I take notes with kids. Because you'll often get questions, what are you writing? Especially if they're really dysregulated, if their play is extremely chaotic, if they're all over the place, if they're hurting you, if they're throwing things, if they're losing their minds in the playroom, their fear factor kicks in. And what I mean by that is 
Is my mom going to find out what I did? Are you going to show her what you just wrote down? Did you write down that I threw something at you? Are you going to show this to my teacher? Are you going to show this to my parents? Are you going to, who are you going to, who are you going to show these notes to? So right out of the gate, very first session, I say to kids, every time you come, you'll see me with this paper and pen in my hand. I write your name and the date, and I write some notes about what we do together because I play with a lot of kids. And if you come to me five weeks from now and say, Miss Brenna, what did I do the very first time that I came? I might remember, but I might not. So I can always go back and say, oh, you played with the Legos and the Lincoln Logs and Bobo. That is the only explanation they ever need that makes sense to them, that helps them understand why. And then I do very briefly say, I have all of your notes in your folder. Your folder is in a locked cabinet. No one has the key except for me. No one will ever see or read these notes except for me. I do tell them that because that gives them peace of mind. So then later in subsequent sessions when they're out of control and they say, what did you just write down? There's a why behind that question, right? We always focus on the why, not the what. So they're worried, they're concerned, they're embarrassed, they're guilty, they know they're out of control. So I fall back on, you're wondering if anyone else is going to know what happens in here, but you know that these notes are only for me and no one ever reads them. So I just set that expectation right from the gate so that they never are concerned about that. Okay, and then the only other thing that I share with them is there's a process. So at our center, every five times that we play with the child, we schedule a parent consultation. I let children know that in the very first week because I never want them to feel betrayed. I never want them to feel lied to. I never want them to be caught off guard by something. And therefore, there's a breach in trust. So I say, and just so you know, every five times that I play with you, I have one meeting with mom, dad, grandma, grandpa, whomever, so that we can talk together and see how many more times we're going to play together. And sometimes they ask me questions, sometimes they don't care, but I make it very clear every five times with you, I meet with whoever brings you so that they are not caught off guard or surprised by that. So that is the way I explain the child-centered play therapy process to kids. Now, there's two more anecdotal pieces to this. Sometimes kids come in, especially the ones that are extremely dysregulated. They are so excited to play. It's really difficult to get them to sit and listen to that two and a half or three minute dialogue that I need to give them. So they're grabbing stuff off the shelves. They're going, uh-huh, uh-huh, I know. Okay, yeah, I get it. Yeah, I know. Okay, what's this for? How does this? And you're just like, woo, I don't think you're listening to me at all. Okay, that will be a battle. That is when your skills come in and you manage it. So you reflect and you set limits. So you are so excited to play and you're going to get to play with all the toys as soon as I tell you two more things. So you just constantly redirect and then set limits as you need to, which brings me to limits. I want to read you something out of Van Fleet's book. I'm actually going to quote this entire paragraph because this is really, really crucial to the whole piece. So as far as limits go, because you can play with all the toys in most of the ways that you'd like, the implication is with the most of the ways that you may have to set limits. But I want to read you what Van Fleet says. Quote, the therapist does not provide the child with a list of the rules at the start. This would set an undesirable negative tone with a tendency to diminish the child's engagement rather than encouraging it. In essence, stating a list of rules at the start gives the unintended message to the child, I don't trust you, so I'm going to let you know what the rules are. I'm mostly concerned about keeping control in here. This is not at all a therapeutic message, nor does it create the atmosphere of acceptance essential to child-centered play therapy. On a practical level, children rarely break limits during play sessions, making such cautious rule-giving unnecessary. And for those who do test the boundaries, the limit-setting skill adequately handles such situations. 
So let me read you just the part of, if you give a whole bunch of lists of rules and limits at the start, the message to the child is, quote, I don't trust you, so I'm going to let you know what the rules are. I'm mostly concerned about keeping control in here, end quote. We never, ever want that to be the scenario of how the child feels. Never. So we always want to communicate I trust you, I accept you, I love you, it is okay. You are able to do anything you want in here within boundaries, but one of the rules of thumb is limits are only needed when they're needed. So children do not need to know ahead of time what the limits are, and it's so cool how this unfolds because I only set limits when they're necessary. So some kids have never been told a limit. The entirety of their play with me, they've never needed a limit. I think I'm a little more lenient with behaviors and aggression and things like that than other therapists might be. I, I really don't set a whole lot of limits. I know there are other therapists that would set a lot more, let's put it that way. But there are children who have completed an entire treatment with me and I've never set a limit with them. And then there are some that I've set limits with, but because it's unique to each child, they... They'll report things to their parents. Let me give you two scenarios. So I had this little boy that I worked with. He'd been working with me for quite a long time. And one day on the drive to my center, he looks at his mom in the car and says, do you know there's only one rule at Miss Brenna's? And she says, oh, there's only one rule. And he says, yep. If I climb all the way to the top of her shelves, I have to sit on my bottom. I can't stand up. And she was like, Oh, okay. So she reports this to me later in the consultation. Like, yeah, he tells me that there's only one rule. When he climbs your shelves, he has to stay seated on his bottom. I, the, literally, probably the same week or the next week, I had another mom who maybe called or emailed or something and said, I just wanted to tell you this. I thought this was so funny. My kid this week was talking about you. We drove past your place and he said, that's my favorite place in the whole world, which that just was so endearing to me. But then she said, and then he said, you know, out of all the things that I can do there, there's only one thing that I'm not allowed to do. And she says, oh, I wonder what that is. And he's like, I can't chuck things at Miss Brenna's head. Yeah. <laughs> and so both boys had a completely separate view of what the limits were. Why? Because I set a limit about throwing things at my head with one child, but that's the only limit that I had ever set with him. And then I set a limit about climbing to the top of the bookshelves and staying seated when you're at the top rather than standing up with the other child. And notice that if they were to talk to each other, they would be gobsmacked because, no, that's not the rule. The rule is but they've never been told rules unless it applied to their behavior in any given moment because limits are not needed until they're needed. So you can have hundreds of limits in your mind that would require a limit or scenarios in which you would need to set a limit rather, but your child never needs to know that until they're ready to break one of those limits. And in Landreth's Child Parent Relationship Therapy Manual, he talks about there are three questions you ask yourself to decide whether or not a limit is necessary. So is this limit necessary is number one. Can I allow this behavior to continue and still accept the child? And is this limit consistently enforceable? So there's your litmus test. When a child is smashing things into the wall, when a child is throwing things at you in the playroom, when a child is stabbing a bobo with a pencil, when a child is doing whatever, is this limit necessary? Can I consistently enforce this limit? If I allow this behavior to continue, am I able to still accept this child? So that will give you your decision-making of whether or not you set the limit, but you only need to set it when it's necessary. So that is my process of explaining child-centered play therapy to parents and to children. I hope you find that very helpful. I think it's always a benefit to us to have a script from which we can work, even if it's just an, an internal mental one. It doesn't necessarily have to be written out. But I think it's always helpful for consistency, for clarity, for communication, to make sure that you say the same thing in the same way every time to every kid and parent, because then everyone knows what to expect and everyone is on the same page.
So I hope you find that super helpful. I can't wait to talk to you in the next episode. We'll talk then. Bye. Thank you for listening to the Play Therapy Podcast with Dr. Brenna Hicks. For more episodes and resources, please go to www.playtherapypodcast.com.